my name is Laura Barron. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm going to do a bit of an introduction about why we're here um, before diving into the main panel discussion, which is why I'm sure most of you have joined us. Um, so what is ACAN? Architects Climate Action Network um, is a grassroots network of individuals within the architecture and related built environment professions um, taking action to address the twin crises of um, climate and ecological breakdown. And we've got three overarching aims. Uh, the first is decarbonize now. Um, most of us already know the built environment as a whole is responsible for about 42% of national emissions. So we, we need to radically transform within the sector in order to rapidly decarbonize the built environment. Secondly is ecological regeneration. Um, so the manner in which we are producing, operating and renewing our built environment continues to curtail biodiversity, pollute ecosystems and encourage unsustainable lifestyles. Um, so we're advocating for the immediate adoption of regenerative and ecological principles in order to promote the recovery and restoration of natural environments. And then finally, um, cultural transformation. So the state of this um, emergency and the scale of it calls for a new kind of professionalism and we need to look beyond our professional and um, personal silos and really harness our collective energy to bring about necessary changes to our industry. So we're working towards these aims through a number of different campaigns, including political campaigning and lobbying, um, direct action and public engagement and research and knowledge sharing, which is, of course, why we're all here today. Um, so ACAN is subdivided into nine thematic groups. Um, the one, us, all, all of us here um, organizing this are part of the climate literacy group. Um, and that is coordinated by the wonderful Rachel Owens, who's gonna be on screen um, shortly alongside other volunteers. So Stephanie, Philippa and Glow are all here, um, but also thanks to others working behind the scene, including Vincent, Scott and Rebecca. Um, so as part this this session is part of a um, collaborative series which we've been coordinating with Architects Declare and the RIBA called Practice Action Conversations and Masterclasses, um, and this is the fourth ACAN Climate Conversation um, out of quite a number, uh, quite a full uh, schedule across over the summer. Um, so the ACAM's um, con climate conversations are all available on our YouTube channel um, and if you signed up to the Architects Declare Masterclass series you should have a link that will take you to all the recordings in case you've missed any and I do recommend revisiting all of those if you're able to. Uh, we also have a Miro template which um, Rachel's going to share a link with in the chat uh, which has a template for all the workshops that we've been doing. Um, so today we're here to talk about reflective practice and follow on from an Architects Declare Masterclass session, which was called Closing the Loop. Um, this was on the 16th of September um, and discussed building performance evaluation and post occupancy evaluation. And I'm just going to summarize what that session included because there were some really brilliant speakers and case studies, um, among whom was Judith Kimpian, who we're delighted to have join us today um, to continue that conversation. Um, the session also looked at a number of case studies, which included Levitt Bernstein's um, Loudon Road, uh, which was presented by um, Zoe Watson, uh, the Enterprise Centre by Archetype, which was presented by Christian Dimbleby. Um, Craig Roberts talked a lot about um, AHMM's Moreland's Rooftop Project, which was their studio space. Um, and Diana, um, Diana Dana presented Hal Tompkins' Everyman Theatre. So a really, really interesting range of different topics. Um, and if you attended any of these events, hopefully you've received a link to a survey. If you haven't, uh, there's, a, there's a link on the screen at the moment. Um, and if you're able to, please fill this out and it should help us learn from the series. Um, collate that feedback and help make sure that we're any future events we're kind of focusing them um, as much as possible on what's useful. Um, so we do plan to conclude this series with an in-person event, um, the details of which are still being finalised, um, so please bear with us, but it is likely to be hosted in a number of locations, probably London, Edinburgh and definitely online. Um, so just watch this space and watch out for further announcements of that and hopefully we can see many of you in the flesh um, when that happens. 
Um, so without further ado, um, let's move on to this evening's main event, which is titled Reflective Practice, Troubleshooting Post-Occupancy Evaluation and Discussing Building Performance. Um, so it's a really important topic, as most of you are aware. Um, the ROBA says that building evaluation is a vital step in producing buildings that fit the needs of people and the environment, minimising waste and promoting well-being and providing a means to develop an understanding of the social, commercial, cultural and environmental impacts of architectural process on clients, occupants and the wider community. So we're really excited to be able to talk about this and have got a great panel of experts to discuss it, uh, including Ishita Pandey, who's an environmental design and engineering graduate working to achieve energy efficiency and user orientated designs by embedding user feedback into the design process. We have Tom Dollard, who's a partner at PTE, who's leading on sustainability and in innovation for the practice. He's also a certified passive house designer and BRIAM accredited professional. As I mentioned, we've got Judith Kimpion, who's an architect and environmental policy expert and is the lead author on one of the most important books on building performance evaluation, Energy People Buildings. Um, and we have Sam Foster, who's uh, an architect at Archetype, whose previous experience includes running his own practice and working as project manager for community-led affordable housing projects and engaging with local communities to involve them in the process. Um, so rather than presenting lots of slides and PowerPoints, we're going to have um, just a really engaging conversation with all of these wonderful people um, framed around the process of um, building performance evaluation and post-occupancy evaluation, looking at before, during and after um, in, in different questions. Um, we're going to have a quick um, breakout room where we want you to think about what you want to get out of this session and then we're going to have to move back to the main panel discussion then we're going to have some audience q a where you can put your questions in the chat box and we can be taking questions at the time as well then we're going to stop the recording um and just who, whoever would like to can can stay stay around for any kind of um post discussion discussion um it's entirely up to you so i'm going to stop sharing my screen and hopefully you're all going to see the panel, uh, which hopefully you can. Um, and I'm going to ask the panel to all um, take it in turns to introduce yourselves and tell us briefly, if you can, um, what post-occupancy evaluation or POE and building performance evaluation or BPE means to you and why we should be talking about it. And so I'm going to talk, start with Ishita, please. Hello all, I am Ishita and I am an architect and environmental designer. And uh, I recently completed my master's from the Bartlett School of Environment, Energy and Resources. And I'm currently working as a graduate sustainability engineer at Ruane Construction and Design Consultancy. And I'm really grateful to be here. And thank you so much for having me here. Uh, as far as BPE and POE is concerned, I think I have a very, very fairly simple definition for it. Uh, so I basically love cooking and love feeding people. So that's where I, that's why the idea of POE came from, for me at least, that, you know, when you're cooking for some people, you'll make sure that even that the people that you're cooking for really like your recipe. So it's not about the recipe, but about making sure that the recipe works for the people that you've cooked it for. So that's, that's, POE for me that you as designers, we have cooked this wonderful dish and we have got all our ingredients and the right recipe. And now it's just to make sure that the occupants and just ask the occupants if the salt is fine for them. <laughs> so yeah, fairly easy I definition. Love that. <laughs> no, that's really, really useful. It's always good to refer things back to cooking. I think that yeah. that's a good philosophy in life. Um, Tom, would you like to go next? Hi everybody. Yeah, uh, Tom Dollard. Um, architect and head of sustainability partner at PT. Um, and I've just finished writing the second edition of Design to Perform as well, which is aimed at um, producing buildings, homes that perform. So this is fresh in my mind. And I, and I guess it's fundamental to what I believe architects should be doing. Um, and I don't think we're doing enough of it. I think it's still um, very much on the sidelines of our scope and um, industry. Um, but I think it's fundamental of what we need to do and where we need to get to. Um, and really it's asking the, 
the the critical question which is how are our buildings performing so we spend all this money uh, time investment our clients spend a lot of money and yet we can't answer them we don't know how our buildings form we don't know what people think of them apart from the odd journalist possibly um, and we don't know whether we've met the brief um, and even worse than that we keep on recycling the same solutions and possibly failures into our next designs so really it's fundamental to what we do as a as an industry and as a practice and, and at PT we've made that very clear and therefore I'll, I'll talk about in the solutions stage i'll talk about what we're doing as a company to address that thanks yeah that's really really interesting i'm looking forward to hearing the the solution side of it um judith please can you follow on that hi my name is um judith kimbian i um teach um at ucl um net zero architecture and planning and uh, i also chair the sustainable architecture work group at the architects council of europe working on um, high level policies um feeding into the work of the world green building council's leaders forum and also i'm shortly going to be launching a, um, a net zero masterclass at ucl which we can talk about later if people are interested about what that means but in terms of POEs, so um, there have, it, it's gone many, many years that we've been doing this, um, but somehow I don't think we as a profession appreciate how important POEs are to understanding how our design assumptions really pan out in use. To any other design industry, POEs are a no-brainer or um, feedback really is how they call it. Um, it would be unthinkable to miss out on the critical, on this kind of critical feedback on end user experience and to design for it. In fact, it's called in other industries, it's called UX design. Um, we have yet to implement the term in architecture. We know we have to innovate much, much faster than we currently do. And it's actually only through feedback that we can avoid the painful process of natural selection. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's also worth remembering going back to education that POEs are the, really the best form of education. There's nothing like seeing what you penned being occupied in, in where, over, where, over many years, see how it performs, the wear and tear, what works well, what works less well. Um, yeah, we tend to forget that our buildings are meant to last for decades, the better ones for centuries. Um, yeah. <laughs> And it's not just closing the door on it when it's when it's finished. Um, there is much to learn, both qualitative and quantitative. Um, and uh, yeah, we need to achieve real improvements in building performance. And we as it is, it just me that's lost you. Okay. We will come back to you, Judith. Thank you for that. Um, Sam, do you want to round up this question? Sure, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Ashita, I loved your analogy of uh, BPE and PUE as, as uh, cooking for folk. That's a, a lovely one. But of course, as Judith was just alluding to, there are two sides to BPE and PUE. There's the quantitative stuff, the, the things we measure to the nth degree, like air tightness, temperature, relative humidity. U values, and then there's the qualitative side, what the, the building user's experience is, and, and how do you get to the bottom of that? Because of course, like cooking, you ask someone, do they like your food? And they go, mm, yes, it's delicious. But of course, half of them are lying, aren't they? So what are the questions and how, how do you ask those questions in a really productive way so you get to the nub of what are these problems, particularly on the qualitative side of things? The last well, two and a bit years, Part of the reason we're doing this on Zoom is we've all been sitting inside our homes. And so BPE and POE, exactly what's happening in our buildings is absolutely essential for us to understand. It's, it's not just a question of energy, of course, it's a question of health. Because what we build our buildings from and how we maintain them has a massive impact on our health. And I personally would love to see a lot more on the health side of things. I'm also very interested in, and when it comes to what this means to me, 
it's really important to me that we don't just think of BP and PUE in big scale projects. It, this really has a place on small scale projects, even at the individual house scale, but at the community scale as well. I'll, I'll quish. Judith might be back now. Thank you. No, that's that thinking about scales is really, really um, important. And I think that's a really useful thing to note quite early on. Judy, you kind of cut out apologies um, when you were talking about like thinking about age and lifespan of the buildings and kind of planning for century old um, buildings rather than uh, shorter lifespans. Do you want to just maybe wrap up what you were saying? Yeah, so um, it, 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 I was just saying that it's also key into accountability. So um, understanding that what was in, your, in the employer's requirement has actually gone into the building how it's gone into the building, it's all been enabled and it's been fine-tuned to the end user's needs is a really important process. And I think uh, Christian Dimbleby likes to talk about it as, as you know, instead of defects liability, we should be talking about a landing period for buildings um, to make sure that you know, everything is there as we intended and it is performing to the best of its abilities. Um, yeah, and accountability is the only way to really um, achieve real measurable improvements in, in building performance, building more with less natural resources, right? Mm, yeah, definitely. And that language is such an important um, facet of this as well. And I suppose on that, I guess there is a, there, some people on, the, on this session may be wondering what the difference between building performance evaluation and post-occupancy evaluation is. Do any of you want to tackle that subject before we, jump into the breakout room. Do yeah. you just go for it? Or this one, sorry. <laughs> um, no, I don't think any of us really want to tackle that. Uh, in the past, um, building perform um, so post occupancy evaluation used to relate to um, going back and revisiting a building once, once it's been in use and it's settled after about two or three years. And building performance evaluation was seen as a process that you kind of set out to do from the very start of the project. You plan for it, you define what you're going to measure and how and report on it. And then you go back once the building is completed and you check that those things are booked up and, and you measure what you can and you continue to measure in the first year. Um, but you don't benchmark actually until uh, the building is settled. But it's a longer process that you plan for right from the start of the project. What's confusing in a little bit is there's a new um, BS standard for building performance evaluation, but it just focuses on the POE, on the actual POE process. So um, yeah, I don't think there's much need to dwell on the terminology. It's just people use it intermittently. That's really helpful. Thank you. Rachel, over to you. Yeah, Sam, I think you also had a quick point. Did you want to it was jump in? The, the last few days talking particularly uh, to both of you, Laura and Rachel, has been a real eye opener for me because for years, erroneously, I used the term building performance evaluation as the technical side of stuff, the quantitative side of things, mm. and the term PUE for the qualitative, the softer side, the people side of things. And so, the, yeah, the last few days has been brilliant because I realised that was absolute nonsense for me to do that. So, but this comes back to the point you made about language, us using the terms in the right way is really useful so that when we're talking to each other we're talking about the same thing but also when we're talking to clients they know that when I say BPE that's also what Judith or, or Sheeta uh, or Tom mean as well so getting language right is essential. Yeah thanks very much Sam that's really really useful and I think one of the key things that we want to do today is make building performance evaluation, POE, accessible to, to everyone. And because as Sam mentioned, it's really as applicable to any project of any scale. So we're going to jump into a really quick breakout room. There'll only be two or three of you in each. Um, and what we'd like you to just discuss between yourselves is what you'd like to get out of this session. I've put a link to a menti board um, in the chat. If you click on that now, it's super easy to fill out. Um, and once you've had a quick chat with your group, you can just um, write a sentence or two about what you'd like to get out of this session. And then we can summarize that um, after we come out and make sure that we are covering those points during this session today. So I think we're gonna be invited to go out, go into breakout rooms now.
Okay, great. Hopefully you've had some interesting conversations. Please keep adding in your thoughts into the Menti. It should only take you a second or two. Um, I'm just going to quickly share the screen and show you what people have started to say already. Um, you can still keep entering it and they should just pop up on the screen as and when people press enter. So what would you like to learn from the session? So people have talked about the links between building performance evaluation and net zero. So if you're signing up to net zero carbon commitments, how does that link to um, the actual operational energy use? Um, I think that's a really important one, especially when talking to clients. Um, giving a round understanding of what building performance evaluation is and also how to persuade clients. I think that one comes up a lot. Um, how to get the client on board. We're definitely gonna be talking about that. That's coming up straight away. Um, what the first steps are to embedding POE and BP in practice. I think that touches on an important point that this needs to be embedded in all the RIBA stages, but just because you haven't embedded it in a project um, that's maybe completing doesn't mean to say that you can't. Um, how to ensure accountability, for example, in Passive House. Um, We've talked again about net zero. How can we speed up the feedback loop? In our breakout room, we were talking about the fact that this is really urgent. So how do we um, balance that urgency with the fact that this takes a long time? And we were talking about learning from building performance evaluation on projects that are completing and almost pairing them with new projects. Um, and also the fact that in three years, we're still gonna be in this um, same crisis. So even though it seems like it takes a long time, it's still, vital work before we get to net zero. Um, hopefully you can see some of those also popping up on the screen. Um, the quality of beyond Excel spreadsheets, I think that's something that Ashita has touched on and we'll talk about more and really, really important to all of this because fundamentally we're designing these buildings for human people to live in. Um, and if they don't work for them, those people, then we've kind of failed in our job. So yeah, so I think that, that that's, um, some really good points there that we're going to touch on. I'm going to stop sharing now, and I think we'll go back to the panel. So um, we should all be spotlighted in just a second. And we are going to start with the first question, which is all about before you start um, building performance evaluation. So the question to the panel is, what are the main barriers to carrying out building performance evaluation on projects? Um, and can you share an example of how you might have overcome these problems. Um, does anyone want to start? I can, I can jump in. There's a bit of background noise from someone, but um, well, I think the number one, well, there's lots of barriers and they're interrelated, aren't they? But I think certainly one is the cost of doing P BPE and, and, and the resource, so getting it funded. And that there, you know, I think there's different solutions to that. Um, at PT, we've we've managed to convince clients to pay for a, a, a few projects. Um, we've managed to get funding, um, government funding for some projects, and then others we've taken on uh, as an overhead, as research and development within our own practice. And we're of a size where we can afford to do that across a sample of projects every year. We try and do at least one per team every year. That's our that's our um, task. Um, and actually, Philippa, who's on this call, she's she's in charge of making sure that that gets done. Um, and uh, so I think that that sounds easy, but uh, it's taken many, many years to do that. We started off on this journey probably well, I did 15 years ago. Um, it's probably taken at least 10 years at PTE to get to this position. Um, and we had our first paid POE about six years ago. Um, and then recently we've had some successes with clients where we've put it in the brief, we put it in our scope um, at the beginning of the project. And, uh, you know, that's taken three or four years to come through, but now we're carrying out those POEs um, with a paid fee there. Um, it set, tends to be a separate um, appointment, a separate contract. So the main contract finishes with the design and build contractor. We then have a separate appointment with the first client to carry out a stage five, six review, and then a stage seven POE. And we normally bring in partners. So we'll normally bring in either a technical consultant, who, building performance uh, uh, consultant, um, or a university to carry out some of the technical elements. But then we will do the softer side, the socio um, qualitative or even quantitative um, questionnaires in-house. And we have um, 
templates now for doing resident questionnaires um, across our projects. And then there's a lot, just finally, also, there's a lot you can do, uh, you know, on on your own company's cost or at, at cost um, with, with you know, committed um, uh, staff, committed, com, uh, committed architects who just really want to know how their projects are performed. Um, and one of those really fun things that you can do is go back and visit your projects and do a site, walk around, bring the client along. If you can bear it, bring the contractor along. Um, speak to the facilities manager, speak to the residents, speak to the building users, spend a fun day on site and, you know, make it into a bit of an event. And the more you can do that in a rigorous way, using a template, using some tools that are out there in terms of, um, there's quite a few digital questionnaire tools that you can use in groups um, to try and get some data back from it. So I think that's the key thing. We've all been on site tours, study tours, where we've come away for it thinking, oh, that wasn't that a lovely day. And, you know, great building. I love the balcony detailing. But I think if, if you can approach it in a more rigorous research basis, and I think that's where it helps to have an objective partner. So at PT, we have an in-house um, critic, um, Rory, um, it's ex editor of the AJ. So we, we have him as our in house critic, um, and he provides that element of objectivity. So if you can have someone, maybe they're a, um, another architect or a, almost like a design reviewer on a design review panel to come along and assess your building, someone who wasn't involved in the design provides a bit of critique. So I think there's a number of solutions. I'll, I'll leave it there, but I think the key thing is to build it into the brief, put it in your contracts, and offer it to clients, and you'll be amazed. Sometimes they will pay for it. Mm. Thanks very much, Simon. I think you've raised an important point. And the question that we get asked a lot is, you know, how do we get our clients to pay for this? And I think part of the story is, you know, as a practice, you probably are going to need to do one, maybe two of these um, as a sort of research project in-house yeah. before you have the confidence to write the fee proposal, get it into a contract. And, and that's something that we were really um, unsure about how to go about in, at Buckley Gray Yeoman. And um, I was giving some great advice about um, actually partnering with the university. So we partnered with Ashita and um, she was doing her dissertation project on some building performance evaluation for one of our naturally ventilated office schemes. And I think if you're in a position to open up a project to a student, um, it's really given us a lot more confidence to understand what the scope of everything is and what to measure. Um, and now feel a lot more sort of confident to be able to put this in a fee schedule. But I think you've got to almost see the first step as this is part of your R&D. And I know that that's something that uh, you'd, you'd mentioned before about R&D tax credits and talking to your boss about that. But um, I don't know if any of our other panelists have got any other sort of advice on how to overcome the barriers to start doing BPE in the first place. Uh, Ishita. So, uh, I mean, I, I totally agree with Tom, but I have a slightly different perspective to it. So in my experience, I think apart from cost, one another barrier is that we don't have technical and, you know, experts who can actually, who, who are confident to do POE. Uh, so I think uh, if we, as an industry, if we start learning the process of POE, because it's not that complicated to do, but if you just start learning it, uh, so I think uh, if we have enough people who are skilled in doing that, uh, that might help a lot with the problem. Go ahead, Sam. I think just to build on what Tom and Ashita have said, one of the, I don't know if this really is a barrier, but one of the, the obstacles I've come across as a professional is recording certain things in a particular way so you can then compare them against other projects and quite a few years ago the technology strategy board as it, as it was then did a, a mass uh, national building performance evaluation project on I don't know 200 and odd buildings around the UK and what they did is they set out metrics for how for firstly for what to measure but also how to measure them and at what period certain data should be gathered. And that was brilliant because then at the end of that process, you had this enormous database of 200 odd buildings all being measured, mainly being measured against the same criteria and in the same way. So you could really see how buildings in the south of England were comparing to buildings in the, the middle of Scotland. And I, from, to, from tonight's event, I suspect that I'm going to learn that 
there are moves afoot to standardize how, well, firstly, what we measure, but also how we measure those so that there's more of a chance for us to um, chat meaningfully about how our buildings are performing between, for example, the south of England and the, and the middle of Scotland. Because I think if, if we can do that, then it's very easy. Well, it, it then makes it very easy for us to collaborate and share skills in different parts of the country in meaningful ways so that how you do BP and PUE um, down south is something that we can bring experts up if we don't have those skills up here or the other way around, because Scotland always leads the way and we sell you guys the best knowledge anyway. Such a good point, Tom. And I think if you were at the um, AD Masterclass on PoE, you would have heard uh, Judith talking about the new British standard on building performance evaluation. So um, that's definitely going to be a bit of a game changer and something to help us structure our thinking. Um, Judith, I don't know if you wanted to come in on any of those points at all. Um, maybe just to just to add to that, um, that I think one of the reasons why we don't do it more often is because I'm not sure we are expecting good news. <laughs> and if we would only get into the habit of expecting good news, something that we can really uh, shout about. Um, there's an interesting colleague of mine in, in Denmark called Peter Andreas Satrup, and, and he's written a book about architects document your value creation um, and taking case studies like you know, a school building increasing its attainment after the architectural intervention or um, psychiatric hospitals reducing uh, uh, forced restraint, the use of that, um, due to the architecture, people living longer, you know, the people's homes um, with Alzheimer. And there is, so that I think as a profession, we're not terribly good at talking about how much good we do and the energy consumption is just a small should just be a small part of it quite an important part because our buildings are going to stay there in the mix for hopefully many many decades to come um but ideally we have, we should have the skills to to make that happen and more importantly we should shout about that so um i think that and and also, you know, you, when you tell a client that I want to spend, I don't know, two more days on your project, making sure that you, the, the value, that the, the funds that you've invested in this building have actually been um, delivered and it's going to work as it will, or for a larger building that might take a lot longer. Um, but proportionally, it's not a lot of time for a client to, to, to understand how important that is. If you start doing that very late in the in the state of works, when everybody is just fed up with buildings, building works, um, then then it's very difficult to get back to the project. Whereas if it's something that you build in from the start, um, about making sure that you create the value that you signed up to do, then then it's a completely different um, um, concept. Yeah, it's such a good point. We do really need to get better about talking about the positive impact of our buildings that goes beyond the aesthetic and the, you know, the completely unoccupied um, photographs that grace the covers of the most prestigious architecture journals that, you know, actually the impact on the people that use our buildings is far more important. I don't know whether or not there's any more that anyone wants to say about the business case for some of this. So in the past, we've talked about reputation for our clients, but also, I mean, I've mentioned it before, but a lot of our clients, as particularly in the commercial world, are very focused on net zero at the minute. Um, and I'd be keen to sort of understand what's a good way to talk to them about the link between net zero and targets that they sign up to and the building performance evaluation process. I don't know if you, any of you has any thoughts on that. I think Tom was going yeah, to jump in. in on that. Please, yeah, yeah. I've got, yeah, a couple of points. Um, I think that the net zero standard is a fundamental opportunity to get in there with making this standard for our industry. Um, it, it's clear that it requires a certain element of verification and monitoring. So it's just how much, uh, what level is being debated and, and that should happen in the next year or so. Now we have a net zero buildings standard task force or toolkit um, that started just, I think, last week. Um, so that's interesting times. And I'd urge everybody to get involved with that and lobby for, a, you know, I, I think, you know, when I say 
making sure it happens. It's really about finding the balance between something that's technical and substantive enough with a decent sized sample that means something, but also is not is going to be viable and uh, reasonable for 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 every project and uh, all scales and all all sizes of practice as well. So something that doesn't cost too much is really critical to the solution. Um, but I wanted to add to Judith's excellent point on. Um, on making this positive. We have as an industry always thought this is a negative exercise and fault finding and continuing on from the snagging process basically, but it fundamentally isn't and it shouldn't be um, communicated as that. And I think one of the successes we've had as a practice is we've looked at this as a communications piece uh, and we haven't, yes, it's R&D, but we've had R&D budgets in architecture firms are very small, you know, typically one, two, three percent, but communications PR budgets are a lot bigger. I think if you can go and make this a PR piece, uh, uh, either an article in a piece of press or a film, a video that you can put on your website, suddenly it becomes a lot more creative and fun for everybody involved. Um, and we've done, I think, you know, probably at least six or seven films uh, of our completed projects now. We've gone back and interviewed residents. One of them was actually given a Royal Academy Award um, when we went back and looked at Priory Road, that was back in 2014. And we started as a practicing how POE wasn't this dry um, technical endeavor that would cause lots of problems with our clients. It could actually be celebrated and we could shout about the successes of our projects and what people thought of them and get to in touch with what we all want to be as architects, which is in touch with the people that we're designing for and finding out how it's been successful and what the residents are saying about our projects and what was good and what was what could be better next time. Um, so if you can make it really positive and fun, I think it becomes something the whole practice and your clients will want to be involved with. And as I said, using mixed media, using films, getting your comms department, if you've got one, getting them involved, I think is critical. Really good point, Tom. And I think one way that I find is really quite useful to try and convince uh, the sort of directors in my company to do things is show them what other good architects are doing so if any of you are struggling to convince your clients I would go to PTE's website and say look at this amazing work that they've done and how this is helping them to win more projects and retain their clients because that's fundamentally at the end of the day um, what our directors really care about because that's that's their job is to make sure that they have a viable business um, I think next we're going to move on to during carrying out BPE and I'm going to hand over to Philippa. Yeah, thanks Rachel. Um, so yeah, I would ask, um, so doing BPE, um, like how, how do you define what is important to measure and to find out um, and who should be involved and how long does it take? Do you know who wants to go first? I could jump in. I'm sure others have got <laughs> views on this. Um, I think Sam mentioned the key point that it's socio-technical endeavor. Um, and I think really it should always try and deal with both those if possible. Um, but then what exactly you do, what tests you do, what questions you ask is gonna depend on your brief your project and your client, and ultimately you as a designer, what, what do you want to find out? Uh, but I'd always go back to the brief and ask, have you met the brief? I think that's the biggest question. So um, in terms of the practicalities of that, uh, the, the methodology, um, I think the socio side can be as little as a, as a, as a questionnaire. And that's actually a quantitative exercise. So you're getting kind of numerical values, um, either on a scale of one to seven or yes, no, um, something you can do across a large data set. Um, or if it's a smaller project or even a larger project, you could do in-depth interviews with your end user. So you know, just ask them basic questions and you start with an open platform, but then you could close them out with um, close-ended questions on specifics if you want to know. But it could just be, Know, three or four questions to the to the client to the end user to an as big sample as you've got time for um we do normally say you want you know, a 10 percent sample um but really it's got to be managed by what time and effort resource you've got within your practice and then the technical side again that's 
we've got a menu at PT of things that we offer um, and the industry is getting much better at this. There's better smart meters, smart monitors every day. There's getting a lot easier to do. Um, you know, things like air quality monitoring is very cheap now. Um, energy monitoring is getting a lot cheaper. Um, but certainly I'd be looking at energy um, at point of meter. So the overall energy reading, um, I'm less interested about the actual kit and how each piece of kit is performing. I'll, I'll leave that for government research projects. Um, and then I'm looking at environmental things. So typically air quality, CO2 is quite a good measure, um, but also humidity and temperature. So and again, it depends on what I'm interested in. Some projects, we won't do any technical, We're just interested in the socio stuff, what residents thought, because at the end of the day, they'll tell us whether our uh, heating bill is too much or whether they're overheating or whether it's dry or stuffy. You can go and find that out by speaking to, by speaking to them after one or two years. Um, so there's lots of details. A lot of it is in the British standard. There's lots of good guidance out there. Um, the Good Homes Alliance has produced some very good guidance on BPE in um, domestic. Um, and the Building Performance Network has also got some good stuff on their website. Thanks. Go ahead. Uh, just to to pick up on all of those excellent points, I, I would completely agree with Tom. Just picking up on on your question as well about who should be involved. And um, when I ran my own practice, we were tiny. There was only half a dozen of us, um, so we didn't have the capacity in house. And we, like I think Judith and Tom and Ashita mentioned earlier on, we teamed up with a, a university and. Um, one of the universities in Glasgow, Glasgow School of Art, has a department called MIRU, the Macintosh Environmental Architecture Research Unit, which is why they shorten it to MIRU. And um, they have a, a department that does a lot of BPE and PoE on buildings. And being quite a small practice, we applied for funding for the government, um, something called an innovation voucher, which paid Miru to come in on one of our projects to do pre-refurbishment BPE quantitative and qualitative analysis of this building and then to do post, uh, we, we, got, we got separate funding for the post-refurbishment but the having this organisation as the third party that Tom mentioned was absolutely brilliant because we on this refurbishment project which I'll, I'll not bore you with now but we had an idea of how we thought we would refurbish it, but the pre-refurbishment quantitative stuff told us actually that part of the building was fine. Don't spend money there. That bit's really bad over there. So spend your money there. And so all of a sudden we had this baseline from the pre-refurbishment BP that allowed us to use our money in a much wiser way. And that was, um, those decisions were ratified during the post-refurbishment um, evaluation process because we could see that Overall, we'd improved everything. Um, although, and if we hadn't done that uh, with this external university, then we would have gone in with our assumptions and made an arse of it, to be honest. Um, and we wouldn't have had a very happy client. So teaming up with people who know what they're doing is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Thanks very much, Sam. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think, you know, we know that retrofit is one of the key ways that we're going to tackle this crisis and we need to spend our money wisely. So. It also helps to tackle that question about urgency that was coming a lot, up a lot in the breakout rooms, that if we can target our interventions in the most urgent places, then we can tackle this decarbonisation quicker. I think, Laura, you had a point. Yeah, it was just a follow on from what Sam was saying about using some of these techniques right at the beginning, because we kind of thought, think about post-occupancy evaluation being done at the end of the process and actually particularly with retrofit, understanding the building as it exists before you do anything is so crucial to making sure you implement the right kind of interventions. And so it's kind of, it's techniques that can be used at different stages. I just thought it was a really interesting point that you brought that up, Sam. I guess sharing some of our experience as well, um, the project we worked on with the Ashita was a, um, a new build office that was naturally ventilated just off the old street roundabout in central London. So for us, it was quite clear that we needed to research indoor air quality because straight away you think to yourself, 
what are the PM 2.5? What are the PM 10 levels going to be? Are they not going to be too high? What are the CO2 levels like? But then when we partnered with Ashita, she also sort of developed that brief a bit further. So I don't know whether you wanted to mention how you came up with the sort of list of things that, that were analysed for that project. Yeah, so I mean, when, when I started working on the project, I realised that, you know, it's, uh, I mean, because the brief mentioned that, you know, we wanted to focus on the indoor air quality, but again, I didn't want it to limit it to indoor air quality. So I went for building simulation as well. So that could be one of the ways of, you know, understanding your building more technically, if I may say so. And uh, it did work out well because then I was able to compare, although as Rachel mentioned that it, it is a fairly new build, so we didn't have access to energy bills and stuff. But again, with building simulations, we were able to, you know, generate some uh, technical data regarding the energy performance of the building as well. So building simulation could be another way of doing that. Can I ask, maybe Ishita, you can answer this, but maybe others can chip in as well. In terms of um, when you're monitoring various levels in a, in a building, do, do you have a prescribed timeline that you should be monitoring for? Or you know, can you go in and out in a day or does it just completely depend on the brief? I mean, as per my experience, the more you do, the better results you get because you know it depends on the type of data or the amount of data that you collect so that you know you can actually see the pattern uh, so in my case i did and uh, i did the whole thing for 3 months which was uh, because i had only that amount of time but if it was up to me if i if i have to do it again i i would probably do it for a longer time so that i have more relevant results or you know results which i can rely on more so yeah yeah, and I think covering that summer and winter period is really important um, yeah. for to sort of get a whole picture of it. So we've got plans to sort of expand the study a bit more. I think you did add a point and then Sam. Yes, I think just very quickly, there's, it's really important to, um, to know what, what you want to get out of it. Do you just want to um, see whether the the building benchmarks where you expect to be the benchmark? Uh, or do you want to have a deeper understanding of how people use the building? Or do you want to have, um, um, you know, the, I put in the chat the, the EU levels framework. So some of us spent many years <laughs> building a set of comprehensive indicators for things like, you know, the resource consumption. So the, the, the whole life carbon effectively um, energy and carbon of, of the building, so that includes materiality as well. Um, tracking that from start to end is, is really useful, water consumption um, and uh, and waste in terms of all of this is about the consumption of resources, but it's very important. What do you use these resources for over the building's lifespan? So you want indoor environmental quality, and those have specific indicators, not but never forget the overheating bit. <laughs> Then there is climate change resilience. Is it going to, is the building and its occupants going to be happy in 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years time? Uh, how do you analyze for that and how do you check? Um, then, um, um, and, and also um, for the life cycle cost, uh, what is it going to cost to maintain the building? And you can uh, set out targets for these. Um, you can, if you don't have a lot of time and data, you can just say in the beginning, this is how I'm intending to achieve this. Then during design, you can decide to report these, report against these. How is my design standing up? Like, is it how much are we going to cost to maintain it? What's the whole life carbon? What's the operational carbon? And um, what is the life? How many days of over, etc. So you can do all of that. And then when the building is completed, you can then go back and, and check against those um, how it's actually performing. And, but it doesn't have, so yeah, this is the, the ideal route. And increasingly as buildings get more and more automated, um, it's, it's going to become easier to, to report all of that. Um, but as I said, you could just want, you might just want to benchmark what the energy consumption is exactly where you want it to be. And all my meters are hooked up and uh, reporting what they should. 
and I and what I'm checking maybe report remotely for the building is actually what's happening in the building and not something completely different, which and and, and the remote reporting actually does work. <laughs> helpful little little helpful things can can be a good starting point, and then you can take it from there if you're just if you're at the beginning of this process. Um, but ultimately, there is nothing like being able to sit at the table with your client, new client, and, and show him the evidence of what you have been able to create in another case study. This is what works, and I can show you how it works. And we're going to do the same one when you're building, and it's going to work as well. Yeah, that's such a good point. That's one of the reasons why we really wanted to do the BP on this project, because I was talking to clients and saying, yeah, we've done a naturally ventilated building in the centre of London, and they go, but does it work? And I sort of went, well, I, I want to say yes, but I actually don't have any data to say yes. So mm. super helpful because it's something that, you know, if we have the data to back it up and we can offer that as a option, then it, it puts you ahead of maybe some others. Um, Sam, I'm going to pass over to you. What, what we're talking about really with this question and what Judith and Ishita have beautifully described is integrity. So if we want to have integrity when we carry these things out and we don't want really annoying academics to go up and say, you did that wrong. We want to be able to do these things at the right time and in the right way. So if you're doing a, um, you're checking the U values of what you've built, for example, most of us know you can't do that in a 24 hour period. You need to have the kit stable for at least 72 hours, depending on the kit you're using, of course. But if you don't have it stable for 72 hours, then you will get that annoying academic coming in and going, you know, you can't trust it. Similarly, the, the three month study that Ashita mentioned, if you have the opportunity, the budget, the resource to do PUE and BPE at certain times through over a two year period, for example, make sure that if you're comparing these things, you compare winter measurements with winter measurements. Um, I've seen academic papers written where they compared summer measurements with winter measurements and amazingly the heating demand was much lower in the summer. But that having that level of integrity is it's a very easy thing for us to oversee, which is why it's really useful working with um, academic, well, working with, I'm not going to say annoying academics again, Ashita, but um, working with people who um, spot these flaws is is a really useful thing and then it just it means that we can be trusted as well which is obviously important to us in the architecture profession thanks very much sam that's that's great i think we probably need to move on to the next point but one thing that we i just wondered if anyone wants to cover was who should be involved in this so we've talked about getting maybe um, external partners involved but from your sort of experience in practice is it the sort of thing that you know it should be carried out by the project architect? Um, does it depend on the project, or do you say at PT do you have a separate team that does it and then feeds back to the project team? What what do you think is the best way of, of sort of organising that? I don't know, Tom, if yeah. you want to touch on that. Yeah, yeah, we've 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 learned from experience on that one. Um, if you leave it up to the project team and the project architect, it, nine times out of ten, it doesn't happen. Um, so even if you give them the tools and everything to do, quite often practices are resourced in that way where you finish project, you're on to the next one. You don't have that time, that luxury to stick around and find out how it performed, which is obviously what we're talking about. So we've, at PT, we've created a dedicated team. We call it our Knowledge Hub. Um, and our Knowledge Hub or K-Hub includes that POE um, mechanism. But we also link very closely with our comms team. So our communications team who are very used to um, formatting um, case studies um, are very, very useful. And they're very good at the communication with residents. Quite often they're, they're communicating with clients as well. So they're very good at bringing the logistics together, the practical side. So we tend to um, have two parties. We have the K-Hub, um, POE expert, shall we say, and it's led by myself. It's um, led by actually Philippa is going to be taking it on on in the next year, and she's leading a few projects now as the kind of K Hub PTE POE expert. Um, and then it's really important because I think that adds the level of objectivity, and it makes it less emotional and more 
more just clear cut, you know, that you, you haven't designed it, you can come along, and you can be a little bit more analytical about what we need to find out as a company. Whereas I think an architect is a bit more emotionally involved and possibly they've been involved in the project very heavily over a year or so or more. And therefore their, their views are slightly, um, well, they're biased, uh, essentially. It's not to say every, everybody's got a bias, but it's just how you manage that. So that's how we manage it in-house. But I think it's even better if you can have a third party beyond that. And that's why we've talked about the benefits of bringing in universities. Universities also have a bias. They also have an agenda. They want to deliver academic papers. They want to get funding. They want to be very robust in their methodology. So they will push for uh, a harder, longer methodology. So, you know, 18 months of data instead of three months whereas three or six months might be absolutely fine for what you want to find out. So I definitely recommend people partnering with universities, but you need to manage that relationship in quite a clear way and work out what you want to find out as part of the brief. And certainly have someone, if you're going to do it in-house, which I think everybody should, have one dedicated person. So it's becoming a, or a team ideally, so it's becoming an in-house service. Thanks very much, Tom. That's really clear. And I think the K-Hub sounds amazing. I'd like to hear more about that <laughs> at a later date from uh, top Philippe. secret k-hub yeah i think uh, you had a point it's amazing to hear how how well you have set up your your system um and i think you're right in in um in, in knowing when to go um uh, when to get externals involved and when it's, it's okay to do things in the house and one of the things that came up at the Architects Repair event was um, how important it is to actually do it for your own premises to start with. Um, so pick something that where you are, it's not too much trouble to get to. Um, you can study the, the equipment um, on site every day <laughs> um, and, and just do it and find out what you can from that and you will. And it's, it's to me, it's a, it's impressive every time how much people learn from just monitoring their own environment and how kind of architects do get very technical and quite deeply about all the, the crisis. Um, so yeah, start at home or at your own uh, workplace, I recommend, for the first time. And then there is always, you know, organizations like IKEA has an, an amazing women's performance evaluation team, and I know they're always looking for to partner with practices and support them at various levels. Um, depending on, on, on what you would like to add. Uh, yeah. Tom, I think you had a follow-up point. Yeah, just to add that I think um, quite often, and maybe this go on to the next point, but quite often we see building performance evaluations having to be this really robust methodology that's going to be academically reviewed and it's going to be an academic paper and that, that's not really the point. The point is to be, um, a lot, I love the word uh, integrity that Sam brought up, it, it, and that, that's critical. So there's no point in doing this if you're going to be easy on yourself and you're just going to be biased and say it's all great and turn it into a marketing campaign of, you know, how PT have designed this amazing new project and blah, 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 blah. Everybody loved it. So it's not, that's not the point of the exercise easy. So it's about finding that middle ground. And that's where I think partnering with other designers and I see the parallels of a design review at planning stage and you know, go through a design review panel it's paid for by the local authority. I think we should have a similar thing at end of life and have a panel of architects, engineers, residents, multidisciplinary review projects, you know, three, four, five years in, and then having a kind of mechanism for doing that. So local authority would probably pay for it, government. I think that's my dream that, you know, we, we can have this system uh, I think until we get there, it's going to be up to architects to work together. And we've just started a system with other housing architects, um, Levitt, Bernstein, PRP, um, and HTA, and we're going to start reviewing our own projects. So we've got a, an agreed methodology, which is a design review, a site walk around, resident questionnaires, um, quite lightweight, but uh, at least we'll have that objectivity of another architect coming in to review our projects. I think that's that's the key thing. And then really to respond to Judith's point, I think um, you can learn so much by number one, monitoring your own office um, for things like air quality and energy and things like that. But number two, just picking, just doing one of these exercises on one project 
um, you'll learn so much. You know, I, I feel like I'm, I've possibly, I've lost count of how many I've done now, but I feel like the first one I ever did, I learned, you know, probably 80% of what I learned now, you know, I'm seeing repeating things happen all the time. So I think if everybody could do one POE, we'd almost crack it. That's going to really neatly bring us on to our final topic of after, uh, which I'm going to hand over to Stephanie for. Yes, yeah, so I was just about to jump in because actually that's uh, very pertinent for the next question. Um, so what are yeah, the most common findings that you as kind of expert POE BP is, um, have experienced and how have you disseminated those lessons? Are they kind of in your office or um, kind of out to the sort of wider architectural or landscape or beyond? Who'd like to go first? Yeah, Gita. It's a really easy question because I wrote a book about it. <laughs> um, but you know, I think the, the, the most fascinating findings are always the things you least expect. Um, and you know, and and it's always about people and and how to design better for for people. So this this user experience and the UX design aspect. I, I talked at the um, the um, architect of Perform about you know the door that needed the one pound twenty allen to to make it work. It's it's really famous, but there are there are so many of these you know door handles falling off after two weeks, doors not being rehung um, after six months, and um, Gail hailing through the edges, um, things like. Um, and there's a really great example from, from Craig Robertson, who spoke at the Architects of the Clare event. Um, they measured their own offices and featured in the book. Uh, but what you know, he found that, for example, people open windows at 26 degrees no matter what. Um, and you can't really rely on them keeping windows closed and, and when the temperature reaches a certain level. Um, also, people who are on similar floors, but one is taller and has more daylight and, and greater views, people think they have bigger desks. <laughs> they do. Um, so it, there are, it's just lots and lots of unexpected ammo for, for improving your designs and, and convincing your clients that there are better ways of doing, them, doing things. And um, Judith, can I ask you a question? How how have you, or how should people differentiate between things that are just snags, and that will be um, corrected after defects liability, or you know after a period of time, and therefore, you know, arguably not long term issues, and then the longer term issues that are affecting people's lives, you know, for for years to come that possibly couldn't or can't be changed just by paying a maintenance contractor to change something. Yeah, so that's that's a really important question, actually, and I'm glad you you, you brought it up. Um, we have been discussing with a with a small group for a while, which the, the aim of the group was more than talking about indemnity, actually, uh, but that how important it is that that defense liability period, that first year, is turned into a landing period, and that whatever contract you have, you actually build in. Um, um, a budget or a, or a bonus for the, the contractor. If nothing goes wrong, they get the bonus, but if anything goes wrong, then all the remedial action is undertaken from that budget. Um, without the budget, it's very unlikely that things will get fixed because it's just the inertia of, of projects at the end of the timeline of projects. It's just really, it's really hard to get those things done. If you do have that budget, it's while the whole team is still there, you have the design information, you have the contractor, you have all the, the consultants, it's actually really easy um, to, to, to adjust things. And you know, people have liability concerns um, all the time, but all the evidence shows that if anything, BPs alleviate liability so that no one's ever, no one ever gets sued for little snags or the or the um, BMS not being <laughs> commissioned properly. Uh, because everyone just wants to get it done right, usually. And what I think what we see is that BPs generate a lot of goodwill and it, you, you actually end up avoiding litigation and finding a solution together as a team. Um, go on, Sam. 
No, Judy, you finish off first. You've just you've you've struck a chord. You finish off first, though. Um, yeah. So so you know, even for the building performance evaluation project, where there were over 150 projects studied, um, I, I I mean, you, you need to ask the people who ran the scheme. Uh, but from what I understand, there was only one um, litigation where, where something really major happened. Um, and so, you know, like missing the installation completely from several buildings, <laughs> which would have been uncovered later on anyway. So it just got uncovered earlier and got addressed much quicker. Right, yeah. Go ahead, Sam. Judith, you mentioned goodwill, and that I think that plays a really big part. Certainly on, on some of the smaller rural projects I worked on, where we were refurbishing a village hall, for example, which sounds like a tiny, meaningless project in the big scale of the world of architecture, but folk are nosy, inherently nosy. And if you're doing something to their village hall, they want to know that you're what you're doing and they want to know why you're doing it. And so um, building on that, we found that bringing people in and showing them firstly, the building ripped to pieces so they can see the stonework and what was originally there and they had these lovely memories of them was fascinating culturally, but then inviting folk back during the building process so they can see, for example, draft proofing around windows and um, thermal bridge free insulation details and then you get to the end and you do your air tightness test so that instead of a building that's got a, a Q50 of an air tightness of 17 it's now 1.5 and they knew how draft that building is it was amazing how engaged people got with that and that engendered goodwill not well it was brilliant business for us because we got a pile of projects out of it because folk thought we knew, knew what we were doing but they thought the builder knew what they were doing too the important thing about Goodwill was before they did the refurbishment on one of these projects, the community group who owned this building was not particularly held in much esteem in the village at all. But after they'd done it, because they'd involved, the community trust had involved everyone, everyone had a much greater sense of, OK, the community trust is actually quite good at something and they've done something really, really well here. And the community trust then built on that and they went on to do lots of um, air tightness testing and thermography in different homes or in the village, which led to some improvement. So this tiny little project led to more business for us, but the goodwill um, echoed down through the village for another couple of years, which was really, really productive. Well, what an incredibly lovely story with the air tightness test being the village fair. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was a good time. Excellent. Well, there's some hot air balloons and other air tightness related things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I'd, I'd like to go back to the question, which I think was um, uh, one of the most common findings. And I think there's some bit really good examples of socio and combined with technical. That's a really nice um, story there from Sam. I think and he, you mentioned the kind of thermal and the fabric side of it. Um, so certainly in terms of the technical things, there's, there's a clear performance gap that we've seen for, for many years now. And so I think that's probably the most common technical finding and that that comes down to being a fabric fault a fault through the design and also the construction of the building fabric which leads to a, a higher heat demand and therefore higher heating bills and then also the services side so and there's we, we've discussed and there are lots of well publicized examples of services not being designed well, controls being too complex, hot water not being very well designed, you know, hot water cylinders being either too small or too large, heat pumps, problems with heat pumps and refill times. Um, and I think I got into this about 10 years ago, I was working for the Zero Carbon Hub and we did a performance gap research project with about 150 other organizations and trying to quantify the performance gap and we, for anybody's interest, it's been well publicized. It's still online, actually, the report. And we categorized um, the kind of top 20 performance gaps. And then I was given the task of illustrating all those. 
So I think that's the key thing that we need to get better at doing is disseminating the lessons from all these POEs that are happening. I think Judith's book is fantastic. Um, a lot of the social and the people-centered side and some of the technical things. Um, I ended up writing the Zero Carbon Hub Builders book um, following on from that and the services guide as well to kind of industry illustrated guides to show how you could solve some of those performance gaps. Simple things about getting the eaves detail correct so that you could have continuous insulation around the eaves, um, window details about how to center the window in line with the reveal, um, ground floor details. So there's, a, there's 20 details there that have got, first of all, the problem, but then the solution. And then I went on a few years after to, uh, so that was aimed at clients and builders. I then went on and did another 21 site reviews across the UK and turn that into a book for architects. So that's what Design to Perform is. Um, and the second edition is out now, so in all good bookstores. And we've added a um, another chapter on natural building materials. So we've realized that obviously embodied carbon is a huge aspect of the climate emergency. So we've added in a whole chapter on how to build for high performance with natural building materials, mainly focused around straw, hemp. Um, I think clay is in there as well. So I think that just to, just to highlight, I think the importance of, yes, we can all go and do POEs and that's great for each team and each client, but how can we disseminate them? How can we make sure that the lessons learn? I'm not sure we've got an answer apart from doing a book on it, which only few people have got who are in the privileged position of doing that can do, but how can we all go out and disseminate that? Is there a new Carbon Buzz website? Is there, and what's the latest on that? Can we... Is there an even simpler platform that we could share this this knowledge? I think it's also links to education as well. The fact that you know sure. when we're at architecture school, we should be taught how to detail. I remember being in architecture part three. school, and, yeah, or even in your part one, part two, and like yeah. trying to detail your building by looking at Detail Magazine and Detail Magazine, which has details from all over the world, and you don't understand how they work. <laughs> I think learning from books like that would. Is, is, is really critical to, to embed that in our education. And we have an education group that's sort of campaigning for more climate literacy um, in that. I wondered, um, Ashita, you've probably got a slightly different perspective on how to communicate these results because you have to talk to academics, but also to architects. And I don't know whether or not, because obviously a lot of us are going to have to communicate these results to architects as well. So maybe the project team, how, like, do you have any tips for going about that? And it, across your studies, have you found any sort of um, things that often repeat in terms of performance gap or even feedback from architects um, when you tell them about their, their sort of projects? Yeah, I mean, um, Tom mentioned some natural materials and then that made me realize that, you know, we are now going back to passive strategies like you did in the office building that I worked on. And then I, I mean, when I was working on the project, I realized that, you know, as designers, although we are going towards passive strategies, the occupants are, I don't know, I mean, this is, this was my uh, experience, that the occupants are not really aligned with the designers. I mean, our passive strategies in our case was just to open the window when you feel that, you know, when you're the um, comfort, when you, the environment is not comfortable. But then um, according to my research, it showed that the people were didn't even open the window as much as you would want them to. So it was just so stupid to me that, you know, you why we as designers would want our faster strategies to work, but that for that to work, we need to aware our occupants that, you know, we have placed this and you have to use this this way. So that, I mean, or else it's just it just it will fail. Thanks very much, Ashita. Um, I think probably it's time to go on to the Q&A section, but if anyone has any other points that they'd like to pick up, we can do that while we're on asking some of the questions. So maybe I'll start off with a question and then Philippa, Steph and Laura, you can jump in with some others. Um, so we have a question which is about um, integrating BPE in the building practice sector. And this is linking back to this sort of topic of urgency. So BPPOE requires a longer duration to reach results, whilst the pace of the built environment transition is um, needs to be fast, and it is fast, specifically in the global south. So how do we sort of tie up this need for speed and need for answers immediately with the fact that this might take a little bit of a long 
um, time, maybe a year, maybe two years. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on that? I guess I might start with the fact that lots of the buildings, you know, we already have buildings that have exist that may have exist, been finished in the last couple of years. So we can start learning from those um, to inform our designs now. But um, Judith, did you want to jump in? Yeah, oh, well, you said about the time scale, really, right? That, you know, it, take, it takes a while to build the skills, then it takes some time to build buildings, it takes, the, it takes time for them to settle in, it takes time to study them, it takes time to process the information, it takes time to share. Um, I think Stan was asking before about various uh, databases for, for buildings and reports that have been done. And there are, I, I can put more links in the, in the chat for that. Um, I, but I, I really, I've come to really firmly believe that um, because of the, the amount we have to innovate at the speed at which we have to innovate, um, it is, I think you mentioned Laura, skilling, upskilling people. So, so getting this into education and making people do projects like in, in our undergraduate course, the, the MN, um, um, you know, we are we're getting people in year two to study the performance of their designs um, in use. You know, the first project is about taking the real, real world measurement, but it's really fun and you can do amazing design projects around it. You can design with this data. Um, and yeah, I, I really think architects can build the skills um, to, to design with it. And, and without architects being on board, um, net, net, net zero is going to remain a mirage, really. We, we really need really the architects to, to get this into the, the grain of the profession and, 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 the, and, and the construction profession as a whole. Um, yeah, I don't think without architects, we can get to net zero quickly enough. And in a way that, you know, it's a, it's a way of life, it's a way of thinking, it's much deeper than, than kilowatt hours to meet the start of the It's a cultural thing, and that's what we're good at as architects. We're good at culture and building cultures to buildings and persuading our clients to fund us to do it. Yeah, I always like try try and think because it can be quite overwhelming to sort of think of the scale of the challenge that we've got. But I think I always try and encourage people that they've got we've got skills. We're all intelligent people. We've you know got multiple multiple degrees for what they're worth. And I think the the important thing is is just recalibrating the skills that we've already got rather than everybody having to go back and do a new degree or a new PhD or something. It's kind of you know just. And giving having the confidence to know that we can do this and we can we, you know we need to get on with it and it's important and we need to do it quickly um but we've got this it's okay i don't know if uh we've only we're, i'm conscious we've only got a couple of minutes left so i am i'm i know that panelists have been uh answering questions as we, they come up in the chat so Hopefully, I think there's a way to save the chat. So there's lots of useful links and things in there. So please make sure you do that if you want to save that knowledge. Um, has anyone got any kind of closing thoughts or comments or anything else they'd like to add? I'd personally like to thank you all for joining us. I think I've got so much out of this session. It's been really good. And I, there's almost so much information. I'm going to have to go back and re-listen to it. So uh, it will be the recording will be available on our YouTube channel. So uh, share it around your offices as well. Um, thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. thanks so much, everyone. Um, what we usually like to do at this point is we'll probably end the recording, but then if you want to stick around and join us in a sort of more open conversation, you can turn your camera on, you can have a chat, and we can have a chat amongst us. Some of us might stay, some of us might go, um, but it means that you can ask some questions that you might not want to ask in the chat or you might want to have a specific question. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, we'll stop.